Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Steel of Sanctuary podcast. I'm your host, Dave Ribeiro from SteelerSanctuary.com. And today we've got Nick Farabaugh back on from Steelers Now. Nick, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. Appreciate you having me on, as always. It's always a good time coming on here and talking some ball. Always appreciate you being on. Uh, draft is over. We can take a sigh of relief now. <laughs> Things have slowed down a little bit. Um, I do want to go over the draft with you because uh, we haven't spoken since the draft happened and get your take on some things. Uh, let's start right off the top. Troy Fuatanu falls to the Steelers at 20. Uh, very unexpected. Uh, I know you're a big fan of Fuatanu. I had to go back and watch him a little bit because I did not think he was going to be there when the Steelers picked. What are your thoughts on the Steelers' first round pick? Uh, an awesome draft pick. I really do believe he was one of the best offensive tackles in the class. I think he was the third best in this class to me personally. Um, I liked him better than Taliese Fuaga. Um, who went before him, six picks, before him, I had him as my OT3. Um, you know, this is a guy, man, that is just plug and play, let him go. Um, going to be almost 24 years old, so he's on the older side, but I don't care because he's going to play for a decade. <laughs> um, special athlete, man. I mean, he, his ability to move out in space on screens, go reach the second level on outside zones. Um, you pull him, he gets out, and he can locate on the pin and poles real well and just hit that target – you know, the, his ability just to square up guys, and he plays a little reckless and wild, and not everything's conventional with him, but it works, and it's going to mm -hmm. work. Um, not just because of his athleticism, because, you know, he's got this great hand, he's just great grip strength, he uses his length really well. Um, and he's very unorthodox frame, um, because he's a little smaller, but um, has great length and uses that length extremely well. And with his athleticism, I really do think that, you know, you're going to see him be a day one starter on the left or the right side. I think he can play all five positions on the offensive line. So that's something you consider down the line. You know, if a hole opens up next year, guard or um, something like that, maybe they want to push him in. Um, I don't think they will, but I think he can stick a tackle. I, I don't think there's a lot of, um, you know, concerns with this game. I think the biggest concern I have with this game, two big concerns I have with this game are one, I do think he oversets a little bit so he can open up the inside gate a little bit, but he has the athleticism and recovery ability and he has phenomenal balance um, to play with this aggressiveness. And he just does not end up on the ground very often um, really sticks out to me. So usually he can recover on those. There'll be times though, you know, against the freak aliens of nature, I'm sure he'll learn this in training camp when TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith yeah. get him on a spin move inside. I expect that to happen. Um, but he's, <laughs> he's you know, got to clean that up a little bit. I also think, you know, when we talk about the aggressiveness, I do think he can uh, get caught a little bit out of position sometimes, and he gets called for some holds. Um, so penalties can be a little bit of an issue there. But um, he's a really good player. Uh, to me, he was a top 10 player in this class. So phenomenal value. And I think really makes this offensive line better. Would not surprise me if by the end of the season he's the best offensive lineman on the team. Wow. Um, he's got to play right tackle right off the bat, right? I mean, how long do you figure before Broderick Jones gets moved to left tackle and Dan Moore is on the bench? We know Mike Tomlin can be a little stubborn about these things, but. Um... You know, I guess you have to see how he does in camp first. You know, even the most yeah. polished guys sometimes have hiccups. Yeah. Um, and the question is, does he play right or left? I, I don't know. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of pegging him as the right because of, you know, the, all the talk this offseason of Broderick being uncomfortable yep. on the right and moving back yep. to left. Man, I'm still not, you know, I would let that play out. Um, like, I wouldn't go into training camp or OTAs with Fao Tanu, like, pegged as the right or the left or Broderick pegged as the right or the left. Like, let's see where they're comfortable at. Cause who knows, maybe Broderick with the whole off season of training at right tackle. He's very comfortable there. Now he looks better. Sometimes that can happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe follow Tanu when you put him at right tackle, just doesn't look good. I mean, that, that can happen too. You think he yeah. can do it, but you actually don't get mm -hmm. to see it until you see him do it. So I think they need to keep that door open, but let's say all things work out. You know, he looks fine at right tackle. Broderick is back at left. Yes. He should be the starting day one right tackle. Absolutely. Uh, any concerns about the rap report report about the injuries, the Liz Frank and the, the knee stuff. Um, I was completely unaware of that. And he kind of inferred that that's why Fuatano dropped. I think it's more all the quarterbacks that were taken and stuff pushed him down. But I mean, it could be injury related too. Yeah, I'm sure some teams also viewed him as a guard just because, you know, mm -hmm. the 
unconventional size that he has with his length. And some people still are convinced he's an interior offensive lineman. I don't really get it. Um, but I think, you know, the injuries aren't going to be a huge deal. Um, the Liz Frank and knee injuries all happened, I believe, at least four or five years ago. Yeah. And he hasn't really been banged up since. Um, so he's been pretty standard, sturdy, played a lot. Um, so doesn't really worry me a ton. Um, he said he didn't even know where the knee came, knee stuff came from. Like he suffered, I think, his sophomore year of high school, and he said it hasn't bothered him in like five years or six yeah. years or however long that. it's been since that. So I don't, I don't really know, you know, where that kind of dropped. That could have been one of those sneaky leaks that, uh, you know, a team kind of planted to try and get him to fall. Um, that might be one Maybe. of the, one of those, I, but I'm not concerned about the injuries. Or somebody covering their ass for not drafting him, letting that yeah. leak that, hey, you know, <laughs> he's in it. All right, let's move on to pick two. This was a slam dunk, Zach Frazier. Um, Dave and I debated uh, the whole offseason on whether or not he would make it to 51. And if he didn't, how much trouble the Steelers would have been in. But he fell right into that lap at 51. Plug and play center, right? Just yeah, almost perfect. Oh, my goodness. Um, you want to talk about plug and play center. Um, this guy, man is going to be a decade-long starter for this team. I really believe that. Um, just so polished. He's a smaller guy with l- some length, so some guys that can get into his frame and push him back sometimes, but it doesn't happen very often. I think people latched a little bit too much onto the Texas tape, and Byron Murphy's a very special oh, yeah. player. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right? And, I mean, they'll play. he'll play guys that can push him back, but even against guys like Murphy, like, it takes him one, two, three, four. Like he loses very slowly when he does lose. So even if you can push him back, it's not like Kendrick Green where it's two seconds and boom, he's on your lap, right? <laughs> um, that's not what's going to happen with him. I don't think he's an, as an elite athlete as a Jax Paris Johnson or Graham Barton. But I also thought, you know, when you were talking about a guy where, okay, you look at him and you're like, plug and play. Who's going to be the easy, most easily projectable guy into just starting center week one? I thought he was that. I still think JPJ might be a better guard. Um, could not snap for the life of him at yeah. Oregon or the Senior Bowl, and he will play guard with the Raiders. I think that might yep. be his long term spot. Um, Barton, you know, might be a better guard than a center too. Um, so Fraser was the most easily kind of projectable, very polished center. I just think he's a he doesn't really have much to learn. Um, he's such a polished player i do think you know the the wrestling background really shows up plays some great leverage plays mm-hmm. with great angles um really can square up guys even if he's not moving them he cuts them off so you can kind of get through there on the run game and again he loses so slowly in pass pro got good hand usage um very good balance as well um so he just has really good traits that just kind of stack on each other um i get the lack of special athleticism um in space isn't you know it's 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 good but it's not special um it does kind of cap the ceiling a little bit more but i still think he's gonna be a very very good center for yeah i agree i mean the athleticism maybe but at center you've got compared to what we've had the last five years this is this is a home run this is no brainer uh, next up is Roman Wilson, um, bigger, stronger, better blocker than Calvin Austin slot guy, maybe a little outside. Um, another great pick. I mean, I thought he would go late second. They got him in the third. Um, not much to complain about Roman Wilson either. Right. Four, no four speed too to top it off. Yeah. Four, three actually. He is a speedy dot all over the field. Mm-hmm. I mean, he flies in his routes. I don't think he's a, outside guy yet but i do think there's that capability in his game to grow there um by you know year two or year three to be the outside guy um you know right now though this guy eats over the middle i mean between the numbers crossers man he like killed teams on the crossers (laughs) yeah he did and you can see why right because the guy is just like he flies like across the field. That's part of the 
I guess, intrigue of him and also the downside. I don't think he knows what route pacing is. So there's not much nuance in, in his routes or his releases. He kind of just speed releases and goes, which is where he's going to have to grow because when you speed release all the time, those lengthier corners, especially if you're smaller, are going to get in your chest and beat you in press coverage. And mm -hmm. That's why he can't really play outside yet. Um, so once he learns to pace his routes a little bit and kind of, you know, put more in his bag, which I think he started to do at the Senior Bowl, I really thought his Senior Bowl performance was – quite special i thought he was the best receiver there uh through the week um you know this is a guy that is gonna make his hay really on third downs too you know makes the tough catches doesn't drop the ball um makes catches through big hits you talked about the willingness as a blocker mm -hmm. he does it and he has done a lot of things that arthur smith likes to do you know the motion uh from outside to inside into those condensed formations the stack sets um, Arthur Smith can make him an outside receiver, quasi outside receiver, I guess, by getting him into those condensed sets in the multiple tight end formations that they have. You know, if we're talking, you know, 11 personnel, though, and ask him to be an X, I don't think he can do that just yet. Um, yeah. He's got a little bit more route nuance. He's going to have to add that route pacing. I think he's a very good in and out of his breaks, but I think the start of his routes get a little choppy and can have some false steps in them. Um, so he has to kind of clean that up. But this is a really good player. I mean, an 84 overall. Yeah. To me, that is a steal for him. 100%. Um, next up, we have Peyton Wilson. Now, this is this is interesting to me because this is two things uh, are a departure from the Kevin Colbert era, I think. Uh, one is the age that you brought up before. He, he liked a lot of younger prospects. He didn't draft a lot of older ones. And two is the injury thing. It seems like the Steelers are less risk, you know, more willing to take risk with injured players now than they were before that this was Kevin Colbert would not have touched. I don't think Peyton Wilson with a 10 foot pole. So the ceiling on him is you watch film on Peyton Wilson. He's unbelievable. This is, what do you think? A top 15 pick if he's got no injury concerns at all. Top 20. Um, I love it. I love the risk taking it, especially this at this point in the draft. How, what are your feelings on uh, Peyton Wilson? Yeah. The injuries are just so concerning. Though. I mean, we're talking about, it is you know, not, we're not talking about, Two or three injuries, We're talking eleven surgeries since high school. Um, that's a lot. Crazy, right? Multiple ACLs. Um, no multiple ACL surgeries. reportedly. It's crazy, man. Like it's it's very um, it's very concerning. But he did play a lot recently, um, so he played through those injuries. So that's something to note. Um, but the wear and tear, it, it does stack up eventually. You know, on the field, I do have concerns too. Um, I do think he's. A fun player because he's so fast sideline to sideline he rack he stuffs the stat sheet because he's just around the ball all the time yep but i think it's partially because his motor is super hot and i think sometimes he gets out of position um i think his processing needs to improve i think he's a bit too positionless sometimes on the field i had isaiah simmons flashbacks watching him like they would use him that's a good call so that's i you call. know they would use him off the edge to blitz they would use him in the slot they would drop him back against tight ends. They would spot drop him. He's a great blitzer. You know, I think that they can use him like that right away as a spot drop zone guy. Um, really, I think his man coverage has upside to be unlocked. Um, I think he's got really fluid hips, so I think they can use him there. But he didn't play as a stacked linebacker a ton, so they didn't ask him to shed blocks a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And he did not do that very well when he was asked to do that. So you got to kind of get him free and kind of do different things. I think they have the personnel to do that, though. Um, they have a really good kind of group of linebackers that can blitz now between Queen, Roberts, and him. Um, so they have ideas, but I think they need to have a very clear plan for him because Isaiah Simmons kind of watered in this positionlessness in Arizona, and it didn't work out. And now that he's mm -hmm. with the Giants, they kind of have kind of simplified things. I think that's what they need to do with Peyton Wilson. Um, you know, find sub package roles for him that really allow him to kind of flourish. I think he can be, you know, at his height, a tight end eraser that is a really special player that can do this, but I do think you kind of have to find him um, that role that, that really encapsulates what he can do. Cause he could be a very special player. You just better have a plan for him. So I think that's my one concern with it um, because the, because the positionlessness is both good and it can be bad. Yep. We've, we've seen that in a lot of players that, you know, Leal is a good example, a positionless kind of guy that can't find a home on the field at all. Um, yeah. Next up, fourth round, Mason McCormick. I did a post on my site just before the draft, the fourth round, and this guy made so much sense to me. I was wondering if the Steelers would pass on him because they already took two offensive linemen. They didn't. Um, 
this is this is good in a lot of ways. Depth at guard. Um, James Daniel is going to be a free agent next year. That gives them an option. Um, RAS score was like 9.96, I think, for his position. Ridiculous. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, Mason McCormick? He's interesting, right? You know, an extremely rare athlete in terms of how he tested on the stat sheet. You know, you look at some of his shuttle times. I mean, four, four, five, yep. seven, five, nine are some special shuttle times. 32 inches on the bench, uh, 32 reps on the bench. He really had special explosiveness to 35 and a half inch vertical. I mean, we're talking about a guy that's crazy for three Oh nine. Um, jumping that high, man. I mean, that's special. I think you, the more you watch on tape, you know, the more you see it too. I, I've seen a lot of people say he doesn't play to his testing. He doesn't really, I don't think, you know, I think he does. I think he doesn't lumber. Um, he's a really smooth mover in space. That's what I really love about this kid. Uh, he just moves extremely well. My favorite kind of, thing about him is how smart he is um you look at it and you talk about their offensive line so they had two guys that are probably nfl guys in mccormick and garrett greenfield greenfield was a udfa by the way still don't know why he wasn't picked that was odd um but they also have a pretty talented center but he was young this year and mccormick called protections from left guard um that is rare that takes exceptional communication ability and football IQ. Um, so his ability to do that, I think, speaks volumes about the football IQ. You know, I, I do really look at how he kind of pin and pulls, pins and locates, special athlete there. Um, I do think his hands get a little wide. His strike placement is a little erratic at times, and that can let guys get in his chest and kind of pummel him a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he has to really work on that this year. That's why I probably said, you know, he's not a guy that is – um, ready to play right away, even though he's 24. Um, and also, the other thing, I thought his tape was a little undisciplined. Um, I think he had like 12 penalties last year, and that's a lot of penalties. Yeah, that's a lot of penalties. 15 yeah. games. Um, so, and it was a variety of ones, you know, unnecessary roughness, false starts, holdings, um, all of this. So, I would like to see that improve. Um, but this is why he's a fourth round pick, man. Special mm-hmm. athlete, um, will be a good guard, could be an interior swing man, look natural. The Shrine Bowl is a snapper too. So I think he can be, you know, all those three spots. They can play both guard spots and center for you. Um, and he is such a smart player. And he's a guy that was durable, played 57 straight games, team captain for two years, three yep. years actually. I think he was a team captain. Yep. Yep. Um, so um, this is a guy that I think really brings it. I think he's a future starter um, as long as they can clean up the hand usage. All right, a couple guys at the end of the draft. Uh, we'll start with Logan Lee, uh, first of his six round picks. Um, weird fit for the Steelers, right? Six five, so he's got the height, but the short arms. I think he was only two eighty one. Uh, I looked; he is almost identical physically to Leal, except for the 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 height. He's an inch taller um, and a much better athlete, test wise. So, is this the replacement for uh, Demarvin Leal? Are we seeing uh, the last of them, or? It's the competition for him, that's for sure. Um, yep. Leal's a better athlete. I think that's yep. something that sticks out to me. Um, they're tweeners, as you know. Mm-hmm. I think that they're going to come in with Lee clearly being a five tech. Um, he's going to have to put some more sand in his pants to do that. Uh, they talked about him at two ninety five, but he weighed at the combat at two eighty one. That seems yeah. a little odd. Now, I don't know if he told them he played at two ninety five or or what, but um, you know, he's got some quickness to him. Um, he's not explosive like Liao. I think he's more quick than explosive, um, which is interesting. Um, I think he's got some power rush upside in his game. Um, he's got, you know, the, the really, he has two moves, chop rim, chop rip and chop swim that he goes to. The hand usage is kind of intriguing. Um, it's it's actually kind of polished um, for where he is. So he's aggressive and will get right up in you. Um, I really like how smart he is in the run game. Uh, holds his gap pretty well. Could be a pretty good run defender, um, but he, he's got a frame that can let him that that doesn't really allow him to stick in those double teams. Can push back, um, you know, plays high sometimes. Um, I I don't really know where the the pass rush plan comes from. Um, too too many times he's twenty four already, and I mm-hmm. think he's kind of raw. Uh, you know, I don't mean to say it. I'm not sure he's going to make the team. Um, I, I think we'll kind of see where he's at and what their plan is. 
You know, what does he look like at 295, 300? I think this is going to be an interesting question. If he beefs up a little bit and looks a little better and can hold his ground, I think he can be kind of a, a run-stop specialist. But, I mean, I don't know. Are they going to keep 70 linemen again? Um, I, I still think, you know, we kind of know five of the players that will be on there. The three starters, Monty Adams and uh, and uh, Dean Lowry, will obviously make this roster. And then two of, you know, Fahoko, Lee, Leal, Loudermilk um, yeah. will make this team. I don't know if Lee will – it might be, you know, a redshirt year where it's, um, you know, practice at least put him on the pack, the squad. Yep. Um, but I didn't love Logan Lee's tape personally. I've heard that from a lot of people. I haven't got a chance to watch him much, but I've, I've heard that a couple of times now that his tape was just so-so. Uh, and we wrap it up with Ryan Watts, uh, corner out of Texas, projects as a safety, I guess. Um, I've seen just a little bit of tape on him. Good size, length for a sixth-round pick, you know, special teams maybe. Oh, he's got the profile to be a special teams demon um, yep. because of his size, his strength, um, his ability to deconstruct blocks. He could make one heck of a box safety. I really believe that. I don't think he's going to stick it outside corner, but I'll tell you what, the testing numbers are freaky. I mean, he's 6'3", 210, mm-hmm. and he had a 40 and a half inch vertical. I mean, that is crazy. Yeah. Uh, everything except the speed was elite for him. Mm-hmm. You know, even the agilities. When you are 6'3", 210, and you have elite agilities for the corner position, it speaks to to your kind. Of, he does. He's like he's not a tight player. Like he's pretty fluid. You go back to the Washington game, um, where he's covering guys like Jalen Polk and Jalen McMillan and Roma Dunze, and not, they're not like beating him off the line. He's not well, allowing right? a ton of separation. Mm-hmm. Most of what actually happened and where he lost was he loses the football in the air. His ball tracking is not good. Um, so the ball skills really are questionable and he can lose it in the sun, um, and, and have a tough time there kind of tracking the football. But I mean, we're talking about a guy at six foot three, two thirteen. That's what he measured as pro day. Mm-hmm. He had a four, one, three short shuttle with six, eight, two, three cone. I mean, that's really good for that size. Really good. Um, you know, four, five, three, 40. It's not terrible. That's um, decent. Yeah, that's yeah. decent. For that size, you can do that. Um, I don't think he sticks at corner, but I do think he can be a strong safety, box safety that can work out in the slot, cover these tight ends. I think that's where he's really going to – at his ceiling, I think he can become a big tight end eraser. Um, you know, he's a physical player. He's got a special teams ace profile to him, absolutely, because of his athletic traits, his ability to beat blocks. Like That is one thing he really does well in the screen game. He just kicks butt in the screen game because – he comes downhill, hits well. He's a great tackler in space. Um, so th- this is a guy to me, you know, that probably is a, sa- a strong safety at the NFL level and could really be a special player if you get him to fully buy in. I know in the past he hasn't wanted to move to safety, but if he could be a safety sub-package piece that can go up against tight ends, I, I think we're talking about a guy – that can stay in the NFL and certainly be a, a, a worthy special team. Uh, sounds like he almost has a better shot of making the roster than uh, Logan Lee does at this point, even though he's yeah. drafted after him, right? I mean, listen, the corner room is far more open. There's no doubt yeah, about that. Sure. And also, the safety you know, room, too. The safety room is, too. So yeah. I think, you know, listen, they need special teamers. I mean, they lost Jake, specialty, they right. lost Miles Boykin. Yep. Like, Ryan Watts could be the first gunner and Mm -hmm. he on the kickoffs. Like, yeah, he definitely has an easy path to make this roster if he can do it. And he's been playing special teams since his freshman year at Ohio State. So um, he's not going to have to learn a lot of it. All right, let's switch gears into what's going to happen next. Um, Brian McFadden had uh, Twitter on fire for a little while there where he uh, posted that something's going to something's very close, a significant playmaker. Uh, That was about almost 48 hours ago now. So I don't know what's going on, but we've heard all the names, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, Cortland Sutton, Cortland Sutton, DK Metcalf. Uh, out of those four, who would you prefer if they do make a big trade? Well, I think the obvious one's Ayuk. Just yeah, because, Ayuk's by I mean, a mile, right? Right, Like, but the cost is going to be the, the most expensive by far. Um, but like, let's be real here. Ayuk's a top 10 player, great route runner, blocker, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just, are you willing to pay that much? Both not only in the draft capital, but you're gonna to have to give them a thirty plus million dollar per year contract. Yep. Um, so it you have to swallow that pill. Um, in terms of likeliest, I still think it's Sutton. 
Um, cause I know the Broncos haven't wanted to trade him for a while, but, um, he doesn't want to stay there if they don't give him a new contract. Steelers will have to give him a new contract too. It's a question, but, um, he's the wide receiver too. His contract right now runs out exactly when they would start paying George Pickens. Um, I think that has to be a consideration for the future too. Um, theoretically you want to keep Pickens around long-term as long as drama stuff doesn't continue yes. right um but theoretically that would be your plan so Sutton kind of fits in well there you know I don't believe anything about like the DK Metcalf stuff um makes no sense to trade a 26 year old uh, in his prime when you're in a win now window with Gino um Debo makes sense to me it and the reason like I say that sense, is because right? I hope the 49ers know better um and by what I mean is that they should keep Brandon Ayuk um yeah. <laughs> hey, you can trade deep. That that's be should be what they should do. And so I would, if I were personally uh the 49ers trade Debo. Um, kind of a weird fit with the Steelers just because I think they want a bigger physical guy like Mike Williams or Cortland Sutton or DK or whoever, right? Or mm -hmm. they Brandon Ayuk is just one of those guys where it's just like it who cares, matter, right? right? Yeah, I mean it doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, but Debo's, you know, a really physical guy that's been injured a lot recently, great yak threat. Just offers a little bit different uh, than I think Arthur Smith really ever had. I think he could eat, though, in that offense. Um, but I think they want two vertical threats that Russ can just go, yep, go ball, buddy. Yep. Um, so I, I, I get it. But um, Debo would be interesting. I don't know what they would want for Debo, though. Um, seemed like they wanted a second-round pick, and the Steelers didn't want trade that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really blame them for that. I'd probably trade a third for Debo. I don't really know, man. I think, you know, this wide receiver trade thing, it's going to take a while. Um, I don't think Brian McFadden's wrong in that he was hearing things. I think they have called. I think that they want to add a receiver through the trade market. But That's been reported right. all offseason pretty much it's, that they've been sniffing it's, around. It's happening. They've been calling teams. No team yeah. wanted to trade their wide receiver that's worth a darn. Yeah. I mean, they could have traded for Zay Jones if they really wanted to. The Jaguars called. You know, a ton of teams about trading Zay Jones, and now he's on the open market. Yeah, they can have him so, for free now. Yeah, basically, if they want to. Um, I, I do kind of wonder when the point comes when Omar um, goes away from the trade market and just calls up one of these free agents. Because the wide receiver free agent market doesn't have, you know, um, the superstars like an Ayuk or a Debo or a, even a Cortland Sutton out there. But, you know, it does have DJ Chark, who is – undoubtedly an upgrade over everything they have and gives them pretty baseline level play there on the outside. Um, if you want splashier names, there's still Tyler Boyd, Michael Thomas, Odell Beckham Jr., um, all these names out there. But I, I look at, you know, DJ Chark is making a lot of sense. I guess they could even go, if they really wanted to shake the boat, go for MVS. But um, you, yeah. you saw how he was with the Chiefs. I think Chark, if they're going to go – free agent route. I think Chark is the best option for them. He's clear I mean, he doesn't really separate. He's been hurt. Um, but he is absolutely an upgrade over Van Jefferson and Quez Watkins. So uh yeah, hundred percent. That, that, that's I, I think trade is like okay, they get a legitimately good player and then the free agency is the backup of like, okay, get a fine player so this room isn't just a complete disaster if Roman Wilson or George Pickens gets hurt. Yeah. Hey, I don't, God forbid right now, if one of those guys got hurt, I do think Debo Samuel is the most likely because, but he scares me. You know, you talked about his physical play and his injury concerns. That's not a guy, I guess they're not looking for a long-term solution anyway. They're just looking for a, a one or two year guy. Um, Brandon Ayuk's obviously the, the, the dream scenario. Um, again, I don't, I'm with you. I don't believe the DK Metcalf stuff. I, why would the Seahawks trade him for what, what reason? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and in the free agency, you brought up a lot. Tyler Boyd still out there. I know he's not exactly the the vertical threat that that they might be looking for. OBJ scares me. I, I don't. I don't want anything to do with OBJ. Uh, if I had to guess right now, I think DJ DJ Chark makes the most sense I and mean, the easiest, the path of least resistance. Right? You don't have to trade anything. Contract won't be too crazy. And maybe you go in 25 and draft another guy. Yep, 100%. Um, he's the way to go, I think. I just I just think, you know, DJ Chark can give you 600 yards in a season, can be a dependable player. 
Like, that's really what he can be, and that's really what they need there. Like, if you're not going to get, you know, a, a guy that is a difference maker this year, get a guy that can at least be dependable for you and give you baseline level play. That's really what they need, and Chark can do that. So, you know, it wouldn't cost much either. Um, so yeah. I really think, you know, that would be a good move for them um, to get DJ Chark, and then maybe, you know, you could circle back around at some point and see how the trades are going. But I just think you need someone there. Um, to be like, okay, this is going to be a disaster if they don't add anybody. I mean, yeah. they're going to add someone. It's just going to be who it is. And huh, I mean, maybe the likeliest right now is Chark um, yeah. to, to kind of sign. I hope we're not uh, underestimating how much they like the guys they have. And they're, they're fine with going Van Jefferson. I don't think they are. Yeah, I Otherwise, I don't not. think they'd be calling around like they are. True. Um, True. Good point. So. Uh, I think the, they're going to add someone. Yeah. Uh, the other position that they need to fill is uh, slot corner. I'm personally surprised that uh, they haven't brought back Chandon Sullivan or Patrick Peterson to kind of fill that role. I, I thought for sure the day after the draft, they would knock on one of those doors. Um, then we get the whole Cam Sutton thing. What, what's your feeling on the Cam Sutton, the meeting they had with him? And honestly, uh, Nick, when I first saw it tweeted out, I thought they were just my first impression was they're just talking to him to counsel him to get to help him out in his life. And then people started saying, no, this is this is a meeting to potentially sign him. And I was just kind of blown away, to be honest. I mean, on the field is the best of those three options. Oh, absolutely. Any debate. Um, I don't know, you know. It depends on what the stuff off the field is doing right now, um, where he's kind of at. Um, he's probably going to be suspended. So that's another factor in this all. We're talking strictly football. I mean, he's the best option for them. I'm sure that was like a hybrid meeting where, you know, they were checking on him, seeing what how he's doing, the steps he's taking on top of, okay, maybe they sign him. Um, you know, today Omar Khan was on, I believe, WDVE and said he likes the depth of the slot corners. Um, oh boy. <laughs> now, not like I believe what Omar says after all the um, smoke yeah. screen he's done this offseason. Yeah. Full faith in Kenny Pickett. Yep. Loves the internal options at center. Yeah. Um, just don't listen to what Omar says. They're going to add a slot corner. Um, now, they do have options. There's people that are like, they literally don't have a slot corner. They do have slot corners on the roster. They have like four of them, actually. Beanie Bishop, the yep. UDFA from West Virginia, is one of them. Uh, Josiah Scott from the Eagles has played over 700 snaps in his career and started a whole season in Philadelphia in the slot. Mm -hmm. He's probably someone we should be talking about a little bit more because he's a veteran. Luke Barku was on the practice squad all last year and actually I think has some intriguing traits. Um, he's a ball hawk. And then the other guy I would point to uh, that's really kind of interesting is Thomas Graham, who was with the Browns. Um, and it has experience in the slot. So they have about four options um, that can emerge, and maybe there's a Mike Hilton in there. I don't know. You, you never know, right? Sometimes these guys come out of nowhere and emerge. I think Bishop has an interesting opportunity to kind of really show out. I like being Bishop's tape. Um, fiery slot corner that comes down and makes plays in the run game, struggles in coverage a little bit, but you know if they can get a, a pass-down guy, a pass-first guy, I'm cool with being Bishop being the rundown slot. Um, so I'm kind of interested to see what they do. I think my guess right now would be that they're going to just bring back Pat Pete. I just, he's the safest option from yep. every angle possible. Um, so I don't know, maybe your slot corner position is, is Pat Pete and Beanie Bishop. Maybe that's what it ends up being. I would not be surprised at that whatsoever at this point. I mean, we knew going into the draft, they weren't going to be able to fill every hole. I mean, you're not going to get a starter after the third round more than likely they should get really lucky. So they decided to pass on slot corner, which it's probably the best idea. You, you fill out the offensive line, you grab a wide receiver, and then you look for a slot corner somewhere along the line. Um, other than that, man, uh, this this draft was universally heralded as one of the better drafts out of anybody. And and you can't help but be optimistic for the season, right? It, I guess it all comes down to Russell Wilson, Justin Fields, and how they play. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking think playoffs have, yeah. is a minimum for this team and hopefully a lot more than that. How do you feel about the – the upcoming season. I think the roster is upgraded in multiple spots. They're better on the offensive line. They're better quarterback. Even if you have questions about Russell Wilson, and Justin Fields, that's a better room than it was last year. Hundred percent. Probably downgraded at receiver right now. Um, yeah. We'll kind of see where that ends up going. Um, they've upgraded 
wide receiver three, though, which is interesting. They might be deeper this year at receiver, but less talented up top. Mm -hmm. um, we'll kind of see who they add. If they end up adding Debo, I mean, they probably have upgraded that room, too. Um, they've upgraded the safety position. Elliott is better than Keanu Neal. They've upgraded inside linebacker. There's no doubt about that either because Patrick Queen and Peyton Wilson are going to add a really good element to that room. And they've upgraded the corner room. I mean, listen, no matter who they bring in as a slot corner, Dante Jackson is better than any other corner they have. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I had my issues with Dante Jackson, but you you can't compare him to, like, Patrick yeah. Peterson or, uh, or Levi Wallace. He's Levi better than Wallace. Yeah, 100%. Um, so, he, you know, they've upgraded that room. So, I mean, they've even upgraded a punter. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you forget that, but yeah, right? absolutely. So, I mean, they've upgraded this roster. Um, they're going to be better on the return units too, because Cordero yeah. Patterson's going to make his impact out there. Um, so they've upgraded this team pretty much across the board. So I think you have to be optimistic, because listen, they're they're out there shopping around for slots, slot corners, and wide receivers. Like a move is coming at both those positions before the season starts. They are going to add a receiver. They are going to add a slot. Corner. Those will not be holes for long. Will there still be questions? Yes. How will Russ and Justin Fields play? Yeah. Will the rookie offensive lineman gel right away? Is that going to work? Is the receiver room going to be good enough to give them, you know, the boon they need? I mean, there's questions about it. Sure. Is Arthur Smith going to be the absolute detriment that he was in Atlanta? There's questions to this. Yeah. I get it. It's also a undoubtedly better roster than it was when they were in Buffalo. Um, that's, that's I think, I kind of my take on it. It's a better roster. So they're a better team this year. So things theoretically should be on the upswing. I don't think that me necessarily means they're going to be better than 10-7. I think they have a tougher schedule this year. Um, and I think they're going to have a lot more growing pains just because they're going to have to break in new quarterback, new OC, new rookie alignment. Like all of these things are going to probably yep. cause some rough growing pains early in the year. But um, this should be a team, you know, that probably it to me, even in this AFC, you know, even in this low AFC, I'm expect the expectation to me should be this team makes playoffs. Yeah, at the worst, right? Um, all those questions you bring up on offense are, are legitimate, but it still should be much better than it was last year. It just it should be. It has like, to be, right? I mean, again, even if you're like Arthur Smith is meh, and so me, so even if you're like Arthur Smith and Ross and Fields, that's all mid, right? Yeah, they weren't that's even better. last year. Or no that's better than last year. Yeah, that. they were awful. So it's an upgrade. Yeah. It doesn't matter, right? That's same, 100%. It's like the same thing with Dante Jackson. Okay, yeah, he's probably mid. They didn't have it last year. They had yeah. terrible last year. So, yeah, it's it's um a lot of these spots that we're talking about aren't truly like good yet, but they are better than they were a year ago. And so this team should be theoretically better than it was. So. 10-7 makes the playoffs. I think that's realistic. Hey, I think, you know, if they could fix wide receiver enough and you can like that room and slot corner can kind of be figured out, I think this is the year they might have a chance to win a playoff game. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, what's the temptation to just go YOLO and give the 49ers whatever they want for Ayuk and just see where this team can go? Because you put Ayuk, and let's just say Cam Sutton ends up playing uh, – this is one of the better rosters in the AFC. I, it just is. And then it just, it really just comes down to Russell Wilson, Justin Fields, and how good the quarterback play is because the rest of the roster, if you can put a above average wide receiver two on this team and an above average slot corner, I take my chances with this team over with not over, but with any other team in the AFC. Yeah. And it's going to be weird because next, you know, after this year, 25, the offseason next year, might be even wilder than this one, which is crazy to think because all the quarterbacks are free agents. All um, James Downs is a free agent. Pat Frymuth is a free agent. Najee Harris might be a free agent. We'll see what they do with his fifth year. Um, Cam Hayward might be retiring. Like yeah. it's going to be a, a lot of change. They're going to have a lot of needs next year. Corner, D line, maybe receiver, quarterback. It's going to be a little different team. But they're building a nice young foundation here. I think that's what they're really starting to do um, with this roster between last year's draft, between, you know, if, as long as George Pickens keeps his head on straight, he should be part of that long term. George Pickens is such a darn good player, man. I yeah. I just hope he keeps his head on straight. Um, you know, they, they're starting to build a, a young nucleus where this roster can ascend. 
which is honestly, I, I know Russ is, you know, probably going to be the starter, but <laughs> you should be rooting for Justin Fields to be the guy that emerges there because I really hope that they just bust out some packages for Justin Fields because I can just imagine Justin Fields running behind Jalen Warren and Troy Falatanu in space and just killing yeah, guys. 100%. So we'll see. But it, this is like a year for them to maybe crack that drought. Um, so we'll see. I I think clearly they have to think about the future, though, a little bit with the Ayuk stuff because twenty five that 25-1 might be a quarterback. So we'll see. Yeah. Yep. And again, they seem to have timed it a little off because this would have been the quarterback draft, right? Next year, people are talking that that, that quarterback draft isn't going to be quite as strong. I know th- things happen and we don't we can't predict what how the quarterback's going to be, but that's yeah, Shadur Sanders and maybe the Texas kid. And that's it for quarterbacks. Yeah, it's not good. It's not. Yeah. Um, it's a Shador route. Sanders. I don't know. Do you want to really go down that road? Hey, it seems like Dak's going to hit free agency. I mean, they have lots of cap space. For all we know, maybe they're going to make a run at Dak. I don't know. <laughs> That's a possibility too. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Next, I, I tweeted out uh, a little while. The, the free agent list for next year is ridiculous. Yep. They, they have a lot of free agents, and this team could be completely different. They I imagine tap- that's going to be another storyline of this offseason of this summer is who are they going to extend? I think yeah. we could and see Muth one or two number extensions. One, right? uh, should be... Who do you think is the first guy to extend it would be the question. And it's, you know, I, I thought Muth, but I thought it might have been done already. Is that? I think it might be James Daniels. That's my guess. You think uh, so? I do. I do. Because I think you want to keep this O-line together. You know, James Daniels is not even 27 yet. And I personally would really like to have Fautanu, Jones, Frazier, and Daniels there for a long time together. And McCormick could then slot in at left guard for Sam Allo when he his contract is up. So I, I think it would be Daniels first to me. I think it would be Daniels and then um, then Muth. Um, and I think realistically you can get both of those done um, this summer um, and keep them around. I do, I do think there should be a desire to keep Muth around long term. I know some people want – to see him walk, um, but I think he's a better player than people give him credit for, and he's a really good culture guy. Um, he's just a good player. I, I'm, I'm all about yeah. paying good players, man. Like that's yeah. like, Muth is a homegrown good player, so I would keep him around. And they've managed so far not to redo Cam Hayward's contract, which is good. I think for me, I, you don't want to, you know, extend him. And then get stuck with dead money if he can't play past this year. Let him play out the season, see where he is, and then figure out if you want to sign him to a long-term deal. That, that too many times they've restructured veterans and then had to deal with dead money on the other end. I like the fact that they haven't done anything yet. We'll time I know time. they're really, you know, they're really swallowing that big cap hit, but I think it's yeah. the right way to go about it. Um, he's it, what's he going to look like this year? He could be washed, or yeah. you know. Okay, say he's great again and wants to play three more years. So cool, yeah, camp stays him. three more yeah. years. Fine. I mean, if he's awful, he walks. It, yep, it is what I it love is, that right? they haven't, you know, done anything with that contract. Um, last thing before we wrap up, uh, you mentioned Najee Harris's fifth year option. I, I'm not. I wasn't the biggest fan of a pick back in the day, but I think I want to keep the, that duo together for a couple more seasons. I would pick up the fifth year option. And then see what happens from there. You maybe you let him walk after that, but man, this this Jalen Warren Najee Harris duo is kind of special, and I'd like to see it for one or two more seasons. Yeah, listen, man, it's six point eight million. Yeah, it's nothing, nothing. Um, so yeah, I I would absolutely um, I would absolutely personally keep Najee on that fifth year. I don't know if he's a second contract player, but no. There's really no so reason either. to turn down the fifth year option. He's been a decent back. Um, and again, 6.8 million is a very affordable price. 100%. For- All right, Nick, thanks a lot for uh, coming on. As always, just a lot of great knowledge on the draft and on these players. We really appreciate you coming on. You can find Nick on X at, at Farabaugh FB. Uh, you want to plug anything before you get out of here? I know you got a lot yeah. of good stuff. Yeah, go read the stuff at steelsnet.com. Got more coming out over there. Um, all my thoughts and everything like that. So that's all really, man. All right, man. Thanks a lot for coming on. And uh, thank you for listening to the Steel Sanctuary Podcast, guys. Cool, cool.